You are very welcome to this Lesson 8, a brief introduction to the Epistle to the Hebrews, Chapter 8. The very well-known verse 6 reads, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. Verses 8 through 12 are a long quotation from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This epistle was composed in the common Koine Greek of the Hellenistic world in the first century CE. The text has been very well preserved through 19th century, though, as in all ancient manuscripts, copyists sometimes made mistakes or tried to improve the language. For example, in chapter 8, verse 2, a few ancient manuscripts insert the conjunction and before not man. In verse 10, a few other ancient manuscripts have the simple verb write instead of the compound verb write upon. And in verse 12, a few ancient manuscripts replace the word sins with sins and transgressions or with transgressions and sins or simply with the word transgressions. You can find more variants of this kind at the website hebrews.cura.download. A few definitions of terms used in this chapter. The verb make can mean to produce something material or to make, manufacture, produce something. Or it can mean to undertake to do something that brings about an event, state, or condition, and so can be translated do, cause, bring about, accomplish, prepare, and so forth. Thirdly, in some contexts, this word can mean to carry out an obligation of a moral or social nature, that is, to do, to keep, to carry out, practice, or commit. The ancient Israelite tabernacle is said to be a copy. This word tupos in this context means an archetype, serving as a model, type, pattern, or technically meaning design or pattern. See, for example, Act 7.44. The term new is used of the covenant mediated by Jesus. New can mean that which is recent in contrast to something old. In the context of Hebrews chapter 8, in the sense that what is old has become obsolete and should be replaced by something new. In such a case, the new is, as a rule, superior in kind to the old, and hence the new covenant or declaration. See, for example, these other texts in the New Testament. Fourthly, the very important term covenant can mean a last will and testament, which it normally meant in Hellenistic times. Or secondly, as a translation of berit in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the meaning compact or contract seems firmly established for the Greco-Roman times, and hence God's pledge of his presence with Israel. This possibility of various meanings for common words brings us to a grammatical point, that is, the meaning of words is always influenced by other words and phrases around them, that is, by their context. Thus, when translating or interpreting a word, we must choose a meaning that fits well in its context. This current chapter of Hebrews has several examples of words that can have different meanings. As examples, in 8.5, poeo can mean to make, to do, or to practice. So which is it in this verse? In the same verse, the Greek term tupos can mean a copy, a model, or an archetype from which copies are made. Which is it in this verse? And 
the important New Testament word diatheke can mean last will and testament, or a legal disposition, or even a compact or a contract. Which is it in this verse? As most scriptural texts, there is a historical background to this chapter. In the middle of the second millennium BCE, the prophet Moses led the Hebrews out of Egypt towards a promised land in Canaan. Despite having seen their God, Yahweh, perform mighty miracles, the Hebrews doubted his promises and even rebelled against Moses. Nevertheless, Yahweh made a covenant, that is, an agreement with the Hebrews, if they would worship only him, obeying his commandments, then he would protect them from enemies, give them a country, and make them prosperous. Yahweh instructed them to construct a tent and later a temple in which he would dwell in their midst. Because Yahweh is holy and the Hebrews were sinful, the prophet Moses established a priesthood that would repeatedly perform bloody sacrifices to cleanse away sins temporarily. For the next 900 years, the Hebrews repeatedly violated Yahweh's covenant by worshiping other gods and by disobeying his commandments. Then, in the 8th century BCE, Yahweh sent Assyrian armies to attack the northern tribes, called Israel, leading them away as captives. They have never returned. Sometime in the middle of the 6th century BCE, the prophet Jeremiah warned that Babylonian armies would soon come and attack the southern tribes, called Judah, leading them away as captives. However, Yahweh revealed to Jeremiah that he would one day make a new covenant with both Israel and Judah, forgiving their sins, changing their hearts to know him. Then, in the first century CE, Messiah Jesus announced that his own blood would inaugurate the promised new covenant. Today, Israel, Judah, and all other nations are invited to put their faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins and to receive his Holy Spirit with the promise that he will one day raise them back to life to live with him forever. This background then leads us to an outline for this week's lesson. According to Dr. Westfall's discourse analysis of the book, having dealt with main point number one, consider Jesus as the apostle whom we confess, we are still now in point number two, whereby we consider Jesus as the high priest whom we confess. We've come to point C, let us draw near to God. And as a subpoint, in this chapter, we deal with Jesus' priesthood, how it cleanses us and qualifies us to serve as priests. Chapter 8 has its own argument or internal logic, developing the thesis whereby our high priest ministers in heaven in the true holy places in the majestic presence of God. And a reason is offered for this. In verse 3, he must offer something to God. Drawing an inference from this observation, verse 4 reads, Now he could not do so on earth. Reason? There are earthly priests who do so. And as a corollary, the earthly is only a copy of the heavenly. With the contrast, this is a better ministry, mediating a better covenant. For further explanation, we read, first, a better covenant had been promised in Jeremiah chapter 31, wherein the quotation demonstrates how the Lord promised a new covenant, the reason being that Israel and Judah broke the first covenant. But the new covenant makes better promises a new mind and heart for believers, a new relationship with God himself, and 
complete forgiveness of all sins. And secondly, the new makes obsolete the first, which is ready to vanish. As you read, teach, or preach through this chapter, watch for certain historical Christian doctrines that are taught in the book. For example, Jesus seated in the heavens, in the true tent, as mediator of a better covenant. Talk about the new covenant, about spiritual conversion, and about everlasting righteousness. If you lead Bible study groups, have the participants read aloud portions of the text, and then pose queries such as the following. Verses 1 and 2, what privilege does Jesus enjoy? And what service does Jesus render? In verses 3 through 5, have participants describe the earthly tent built by Moses, and then describe the heavenly tent built by God. In verses 6 through 8, you could ask for discussion purposes, in what ways is the new covenant better than the old? And who is it that declared the first covenant to be faulty? And verses 8 through 9, make sure everyone understands where verses 8 through 12 come from, and why there are two houses, that is, the people of Israel and the people of Judah. And what precisely was the fault that God himself found with the first covenant? And in verses 10 through 12, let participants discover how the new covenant is in fact a better one. And in 8.13, ask this, if the first covenant was about to vanish by 70 CE, then when did the new covenant come into effect? Here you should have participants look up these two verses, Luke 22:19, in which Jesus himself inaugurates the new covenant by his own blood, and in 2 Corinthians 5:17, how that in Christ all things become new. What then are our tasks for this week? First, as homework, read through Hebrews 8, 1 through 13 once a day in different translations. Jot down notes and queries that you want to discuss in your Bible study group. Some voluntary projects could include these. To choose one of the following or another one that interests you. Consulting Bible dictionaries study Bible notes and online web pages, write up a chronology of Yahweh's dealings with Israel, that is, the main events and which century they took place in. Then, using those same tools, compile a list of all of the covenants that God has made with Israel along with the approximate dates. If you do so, Please prepare a one-page summary of your project and share it with your Bible study group.